Welcome back, folks. All right, so I have the um, great pleasure to um, introduce introduce um, Dr. Stephen Sheldon. Um, he is an associate professor um, in the John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University School of Education and assistant director of the Center of School, Family and Community Partnership. He has over 20 years of experience studying the predictors and impact of family engagement in children's education with the focus on the role of school and teacher outreach to families. Specifically, he studies how school leadership facilitates the development of school, family, and community partnership programs. His research investigates the extent to which school outreach to families is associated with family engagement in children's learning and how school and teacher outreach predicts student outcomes such as student attendance and standardized test performance. He teaches in the graduate program for urban education, focusing on courses about leadership for school, family and community collaboration, as well as in the education doctorate program in the School of Education. Um, and I also want to mention that he is also um, working with our lovely team um, in um, in some projects here in Hawaii. So without further ado, I will go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Stephen Shelton. Thank you, Angela. And uh, thank you all for joining us, for joining me this afternoon. I think for you, it's, it's the middle of the day. So uh, I appreciate having you guys all here and, uh, and stay, sticking with this. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Let me just start by saying that, uh, as, a, as I said, I wanna thank everyone for coming because oftentimes everybody is interested in evaluation, people are affected by it, but equally, <laughs> equally as often, people aren't so interested or aren't as interested in coming to a session on evaluation. And so while we all may be affected by it, um, it doesn't mean we want to sit down for 30 minutes or so and, and listen to it. So the fact that all of you are here uh, is actually greatly appreciated by, appreciated by me. And um, so let me just start by saying it's wonderful to have you here, and I appreciate that. So I want to just give you a sense of what I'm going to talk about today. And I'm going to start with just a really brief overview of what the role of evaluation is in our work with family and community engagement. And from there, I want to share two approaches to how you might think about evaluation in your own work. And I know that we have a lot of teachers and administrators here, and that's great. Uh, we have some, I know, lots of people from nonprofits and, and other agencies. And I think all of this is gonna be, can be quite useful, but maybe most importantly, what I wanted to do in giving you these two options is to, to show you that there are different ways to think about evaluation and different ways to think about what might work for you in the situation that you have. And so uh, hopefully what you'll be able to walk away from here is a sense of how you might think about incorporating and integrating uh, processes within your organization, within your practice that help you uh, reflect, discuss, move forward, improve, and, and, and work on some of this continuous improvement mindset. And so, so that's largely what I hope you get out of this and out of, out of my time. And so I want to start by just talking about maybe the work that we do here with family and community engagement more generally. And I'm speaking largely from the perspective of K-12 schools, but I think this is more or less true for, for most of our work with families. So even if you're not working in or with schools, I think this is true. And, and I don't think what I'm gonna say is particularly controversial, but what I wanna say and where I wanna start with is that you know the work that we do, almost all of the work that we do with families and community partners is really, in, in the service of trying to have all of our students experience success in school and probably even more importantly, after school, right? We are trying to, in all of our work, 
set up our set up our children, set up our students to have a successful life. Um, and so oftentimes what that might look like is, for example, you know, we want to create a welcoming school because within that welcoming school, what we can do is start building positive and strong relationships with families. And why do we want to build these positive and strong relationships with families? Because we want to see our students become better. We want to see them become better readers, writers, thinkers, problem solvers, and ultimately successful members of society, people who, you know, as, as I guess maybe as I'm getting older, you know, I have to think about the next generation and who's going to help support the, the, the neighborhood, country, society that I live in. And, and so, um, so that is what we're trying to accomplish with our work in our day to day. And evaluation is a part of this. And so my work at Johns Hopkins has really been all about learning, learning and advocating for the design of goal-linked activities and programs. I know Dr. Mapp said she doesn't like to use the word programs, um, but programmatic work that lets us engage with family members, with community partners, in ways that really do help support student attendance, student achievement, um, building positive attitudes about school, about themselves, you know, building health, whether it's mental health, physical health, social emotional health, all of these are things, the kinds of goals that we want our partnerships, that we want our relationships with families to, to build toward. And so, um, you can see these oftentimes in our school improvement plans or, or the, the school goals, uh, different districts, different counties call them different things, but let's just say a school improvement plan. You know, these are the things that are in our plans that we need to, that we need to understand that the family engagement work that we're doing has to be integrated into this work in order for us to fully realize the goals that we want to see our education system and, and and any system for that matter, even our mental health systems and our, our medical systems, that we want to see those systems um, help realize for our society. And what we know and what we've seen over time is that we're more likely to meet these goals when we have families and communities engaged, not just as one-offs or as activities, but as part of programmatic systemic work that is happening in our schools. And so one of the things that I like to start with is this quote, which has to do with the fact that uh, something that Joyce Epstein and I wrote quite a while ago, to, to, when I look at the date now, um, that the purpose of implementing our programs of family, school, and community partnerships should be to promote and help realize equity within our society within our and within our educational systems alongside our attention to improving student outcomes and student meeting those goals that we have for students. And so this is a really important point. And, and this I think is, you know, uh, Dr. Mapp was talking about this as well, which is that all of this work, all of our work with family and community engagement is at its core about equity, right? And, and it's not just that we want to improve outcomes, but we want to improve equity. We want those outcomes to be re to reflect equity. So, so that's a really important part. And I want to emphasize that because I think oftentimes that gets drowned out with a lot of our attention and rhetoric towards meeting goals and meeting student outcomes be it standardized tests, grades, attendance, et cetera, et cetera. Ultimately underlying all of this, of course, is that it is about equity. So what does that mean? So for, for me, when we're doing this programmatic work, what I have come to see over time is that unfortunately very few programs, very few of these coordinated efforts really take the time to evaluate their work. 
unless they're forced to, right? So oftentimes if you're getting a grant, part of the conditions of that grant is that there's an evaluation that needs to take place. And so we can do that and people do that, but the truth of the matter is, is that in our regular practice, in our day-to-day -day professional work in schools, there's not often a built-in process for reflecting and doing some sort of evaluative thinking in work so that we keep improving over time. And so that's important to recognize because what we've found in our research at Johns Hopkins is that when, when schools and when districts are engaging in evaluation of their school family and community partnership programs, those programs, those schools are more likely to develop stronger, better outreach, stronger programs. Um, they're, they're more likely to see greater engagement of families and community partners over time and they're more likely to keep those programs sustained over time, right? So there's, there's two things that we're really interested in looking at. And this is how do we get this work to become stronger and better over time, but also how can we make sure that we don't lose, lose the momentum when, when, not even if, but when our leaders change. We know that change in, in, in our schools is a common, if not constant issue. And things like evaluation can become really useful in helping us grow strong programs. And strong programs are more likely to stick around and navigate change over time in, in our schools and in our systems. And so, so evaluation becomes really important in terms of our ability to get better at this and to see where our weaknesses are, but also importantly, to understand where our strengths are. So it's not just about seeing what we need to fix, but it's also understanding where, where we're, we're doing things well, because th those are important things to, to take, take account of as, in addition. So the first thing that I wanna talk about in the first approach to evaluation really builds on this, this idea of continuous improvement and how you can take a continuous improvement mindset or orientation to this work of family and community engagement. And we haven't seen this in a lot of work. Uh, and I'm drawing on some work that my colleagues and I at Johns Hopkins have, have done with a, a larger school district over the recent years, um, where we really tried to build in a continuous improvement framework and, and integrate that into the systems and the operations of our schools or of these schools. Um, and so the first step that I want to suggest when you're, if you're really thinking about, you know, working in incremental change and, and, and doing this kind of Im continuous improvement work is the importance of teamwork. And, and this is something that becomes really valuable because what we know is that this is, this is a heavy load for any one person to bear. In, in the execution and coordination of this work, but even more especially in terms of the evaluation of this work. One person cannot be evaluating what's going on or, or the degree to which uh, efforts to, to work with families and get to know families is actually translating into the outcomes that we wanna see. And so it's really important early in the process when you're thinking about putting together a program, when you're thinking about how you wanna evaluate your work, that you bring together a wide range of people, right? So it's not enough to just have teachers or it's not enough to just have administrators, but it's important to bring in the families at your sites so that they can share their perspective, but also to think about not just, do we have family members? Do we have one or two uh, mothers, fathers, grandparents, aunts and uncles, but where are they coming from? Who are they representative of? within our school community. Our school communities can be quite diverse sometimes. And so it's important to try to get people that can represent the diversity of your school community when you're looking to get some insights and um, perspective on what's going on. So putting together a team becomes really important and putting together a diverse team, one that has a wide range of representation on it becomes really essential in helping you 
do that good work. So what is this team going to do from an evaluation perspective? What, what we want to do and what in a continuous improvement approach to this, you know, you want to start by having individuals or have your team reflect on the family and community engagement practices or the school processes or the desired outcomes of all of this work. You want to have them take some time to think about what's going on, what are the aims of this and how well it's how well it's doing. Then you need everyone to come together and have some discussions and share their reflections on this. And this can be a little tricky because if people want to be critical or if they have some, some ideas of criticism, some criticisms, we have to make sure that they feel comfortable raising those issues. So sometimes discussion might have to be um, providing opportunities for people to, to give their feedback in an anonymous way. Um, but at some point, the team as a whole has to be able to have these discussions in an open and honest way, not necessarily an, an overly critical or negative way or a hostile way, but we need to have our reflections left out there. And I think one of the things that makes this really important, and this goes back to, to Dr. Mapp's conversation and, and what we know about these ideas of building trust, is that especially with families, one of the things that helps build a strong relationship is feeling heard. And one of the ways that we let people know that they're feeling heard is by listening and taking into account what they're saying. And so, right, like I can be heard but not listened to. Right? So if, if I feel like I'm giving my two cents, but nobody on the other end is is paying mind to those, to my opinions, to my perspective, then I don't necessarily feel like I'm being listened to. And that doesn't build trust. And so, so these discussions become really important for building that trust and for working, moving forward in this, in this continuous improvement evaluation set standpoint. And then what we wanna do is after we have these discussions is as a team in this model, it's time to start thinking about goals and the next steps, right? So, so what are the new goals? What are some new strategies? If, if it's determined that what's going on isn't meeting our needs for whether it's family engagement towards student achievement, but it's not just that, right? It's family engagement towards student achievement or towards student outcomes, toward family outcomes in ways that are helping us meet those goals of equity. Okay, and, it, and, it, and it's important when you're thinking about this to try to do this not necessarily just once a year at the end of the year. I mean, that's that's a good place to start, but it, you might wanna have these kinds of meetings, these, these opportunities for a team to meet every month or every, every two months on a more regular basis so that you don't wait until it's too long. Oftentimes what happens is if you wait till the end of the year to do your evaluation or to have these reflections and conversations, people forget what happened way back in October. And so having a team that meets on a regular or mostly regular, semi-regular basis becomes a really important way to build in some of these processes, to, to build in some of the, um, the, the structural elements within a school, right? A team at your school that is responsible for family and community engagement and the evaluation of that is, is a school structure that helps really put this work near the center of what's going on in that school building. And so when your school or when your organization is really valuing this work, you're putting in place structures and procedures to really make this work and make this happen on a regular basis and, and making it a, a part of your organization and a part of your site and the way that your site operates. So how do you do this? One of the ways that this becomes that we've worked with schools is we we drew on a lot of this continuous improvement literature and we had a lot of our, our teams, <clears throat> excuse me, working on what we call the plan, do, study, act worksheets. And this is really just a way to structure these conversations that involve reflection, discussion, and goal setting, right? So we had our teams come together and talk about on, on their regular basis, you know, who was involved in planning the activities that were going on, or if it was an event, for example. Um, what was planned? You know, what kind of goals were, was it meant to help achieve? Uh, how did the goals get decided? 
How were they addressing student outcomes and those sorts of things? And then we have, as you can see here on number three, you know, what did people observe at the activity? Who showed up? Importantly, as, as important as who showed up, if it's an activity at the school, for example, who didn't show up? Who wasn't able? Or if, if we are doing things over Zoom, um, who was on the Zoom call? Who wasn't on the Zoom call? And then giving some thought as to, so what are some of the reasons why those people couldn't show up? It's not that they didn't want to show up. Remember, we have to have this assumption that families want to see their children do well. They want to see their, their children succeed in school. And so there are very real reasons why people can't oftentimes make it. And we have to be very honest with ourselves as to what, what kind of opportunities are we creating to make sure that all of our families have access to the information and can uh, find that information accessible, right? So it's not just enough to put it out on a website, for example, but people have to be able to understand how to navigate a website and, and, and make that information readable and understandable and actionable. Um, and then ultimately, you know, you want in this reflection process, you know, what did you learn about families in, in the course of, of doing all of this work over the last month or two? Um, and then how will you use these insights in the future? And so this is just an example of a way that we have tried to structure some reflection and some team work time where people can think about the work that they're doing, how well it's going, what kind of adjustments they might need to make. And so this is just an example of, as I said, a, a, a continuous improvement approach in a way that is trying to really um, make this part of the day-to-day -day work of your evaluation. And so uh, I would encourage you to really think about how where you are, you can start to implement something like this because this type of approach when we're thinking about family and community engagement is, is, much, is a much easier lift than what I'm going to be talking about next, which is a much more sort of traditional way that we think about evaluation and formal evaluations. Um, but this is the kind of, this is, this is a way that we can, we can put this into our day-to-day -day professional work to better integrate family and community engagement into the profession of educators and schools or, or school site or any kind of site for that matter. Um, so how do you do this? You schedule time for reflections. You try to collect, collect feedback whenever possible from families or from family members or community partners, anyone with whom you're working. Um, you have to think about the kind of data that you might wanna collect before you are at that before you're at the opportunity where you're working with families, right? So think about the goals, think about what you're trying to accomplish. What kind of data are you gonna need? What kind of feedback? Don't even think about it as data, but what kind of information and feedback do you wanna get that's gonna help you understand better whether or not your efforts were successful in reaching the people that you wanted to reach? So in the, in the little bit of time, I know we, we are, I think we have we have some we have a little bit of time and I, and I don't want to spend too much more time on that. I want to turn to what we would think about as a more formal evaluation. And this is this is really you know what, when we're thinking about evaluations and evaluative work, it's a little bit more along the lines of research and how can you understand research. And and for some people, this is a way to go. This is how you want to think about the work that you're doing, and it usually starts with the first step of just understanding the big picture of what you're doing, why you're doing it, and what you're trying to accomplish. And so for a lot of us, oftentimes we have to do, we have to do this work when we start thinking, if you're writing a grant or trying to, to get funding for something, oftentimes you know, we need to write about this in order to get that. So, but it, nevertheless, it's still important to think about this and think about how the big picture is gonna be guiding your evaluation. And really in this step, you're just trying to get an overview of what's going on. And so you're trying to clarify, you know, what are the resources you need? What are the activities that you have to, to implement to get everything ready so that you can provide the services that you, you are trying to provide? And what are you trying to accomplish in terms of your outcomes? <clears throat> and, and these are outcomes that might not just be short-term outcomes, but also short-term, mid-range, and long-term outcomes, right? And it helps to have a document. And why does it help to 
to have a document because it helps you understand what you're trying to accomplish, but it helps you also communicate to others what it is you're trying to accomplish. And so I say this because I, I put this as the first step because oftentimes in our work and in our day to day, we're in the maze and we don't always see the big picture of what we're trying to accomplish. And it gets really hard to put together um, this big picture because we're here usually. And what we're trying to accomplish and what we're trying to do with, with this, with the step back and in this first step is to get here to see the maze from above and to see how it all fits together from start to finish. And oftentimes a very useful way to do that is to construct a logic model. And again, all a logic model is, is it lets you write down in a sequence the things you need, the things that you're going to do, the services you're going to provide to others, and the changes that you hope to create in the short and long term. And that is, that is the, the quick and dirty way of thinking about what a logic model does. This is something that I have put together that works for me. There are, if you go onto Google and you want, if you want to create a logic model, if you go onto Google, there are a million templates that you can use. Um, most of them probably look a little bit more fancy than this. This one has always worked fairly well for me. It's tried and true. And, and usually any logic model template that you have is going to be a variation on this. But I put this up here because you can see that we're working from inputs, the resources, to activities, how we're preparing our work, how we're getting ourselves ready, what, what needs to happen from an organizational standpoint so that we can provide those services, the outputs, so that we can ultimately meet and make uh, and realize those outcomes. The next step in all of this is to think about what kind of information and data you want to collect. I call this identifying your indicators, um, which is just a researchy technical way of saying um, what, what is the information we need to get in order to know how well we're doing. Uh, and so finding the right indicator becomes really important. And, and sometimes this is the, the trickiest part of the whole thing um, because you want to find out, you know, if what are the activities that we need to do to be able to provide the outcomes or the services that we want. And so you have to start asking yourself when you're thinking about this kind of evaluation and when you're thinking about evaluating your own work, um, you know, what are what would let me know that we're implementing our work at a, at a high level? What is, what is a high, high quality of implementation supposed to look like, right? And then we need to know who's in the best position to tell us whether or not that actually happened. You know, did we do, did we implement at a high level? And so who's, who's are we the best people to, to, to tell about that? Usually not, usually if we're the ones that are, are doing the work, we, we, it, we're best off if we can have somebody from the outside give us feedback on our work. Sometimes you can't always get that information and we have to really be truthful with ourselves and think about what, you know, what went well, what went maybe less well. Um, but it's important to think about who, who you wanna hear from. And I would argue that when we're thinking about family and community engagement, we need to hear from families and community partners about their experiences with us. And then, other, and then the last way is to think about how can you find this out? Um, it might be surveys, it might be focus groups, it might be exit tickets. Um, there are pros and cons, and, and I'm not gonna go into it that right now, but um, I would just argue that surveys are nice, but you don't need surveys to get the feedback that you want to do an evaluation. When we think about the outcomes, the changes that we wanna see happen, we have to really ask, you know, who's gonna change? Are we, are we looking at change in students? Are we looking at change in families? Are we looking at change in teachers? Are we looking at change in systems, school procedures? Um, what is changing? What do we, is, our, is, is it behavior? Is it our ideas and perceptions, those sorts of things? Is it grades, Indi you know, which I guess would be is an indicator of learning? Um, and then how are we going to know if this change happened? What are our ways that those changes are demonstrated that we can collect fairly easily? The next step 
is really thinking about how you're going to get that information and how you're going to collect the data. And I'm going to speed up a little if you guys don't mind, because I see the time. And if I'm not mistaken, I have about five minutes. So one of the things that we're trying to do with evaluation is look at whether or not we have an impact. And this usually comes down to, are we, are we creating change? And change, in order to, to measure and understand whether or not something has changed, you need to look at something over time, from time one to time, you know, from time one to time two, or in this case, from time zero, pre, to time two, to time one, post. So, so this is just a simple diagram of what a basic pre-post design of something looks like, right? If we can measure where people are before they, they work with us, we have our inner implementation of an intervention or, or a service or an activity, and then we can look to see whether or not their feelings or their grades or their attendance have changed over time. And this is one fairly basic design. It has limitations because one of the things that it doesn't let us do is know whether or not that change would happen anyways, right? So we don't necessarily know in this kind of a situation whether or not the change can really be pointed towards whatever it is we're implementing, our, our program, our treatment, for example, to use sort of the, the research methods language. And so oftentimes, another approach to looking at change is to say, okay, we have one group that we're giving our implementation to, and we're looking at outcomes with that group, and we're going to compare them to our control group, who are not getting an implementation, and we're going to compare outcomes across these two groups. And this is another way of looking at it. It's, it's slightly more, you know, quasi-experimental. The key here, of course, is that you have to make sure that your two groups are very similar to begin with, and, and they're comparable when we start out, so that you can make the case that, well, we have two very similar, very comparable groups. One group got it, got our intervention, got our, you know, we worked with them to build trust, to, to get families engaged, help um, provide insights or, or skills for, for parenting. Um, and we can look at differences in outcomes related to those skills, those parenting, the grades, et cetera. And you can make that, you're, you can make a, a case there that it in fact was your intervention, your treatment, your, your efforts that um, helped generate those outcomes and the differences in those outcomes. I don't want to take too much time. And I don't want to go into this. Like I said, this, this was a very uh, quick overview of, of this evaluation, particularly of the formal evaluations. But it's really important when you're thinking about evaluation to really consider, you know, what are the data? What information are already available? So we don't always have to reinvent the wheel when we think about what you can look at. And so when we think about what's going on in schools, we, we can look at things like attendance. We can look at things like GPA. Um, test scores, climate surveys, most, most districts, for example, uh, get, get insights and feedback on, on school climate and how students or teachers or families feel about uh, the welcoming climate of a school. Um, we have to think about the data that are related to our intervention and whether or not we can easily, or I should say how easily we can get information about how well we have implemented our work. Um, and then finally, what I say, what I call is like, are we, are we measuring at things at the right level? Um, so if you're doing an intervention that is involving individuals and maybe a small handful of individuals, if you're looking at school level outcomes, if you're looking at averages across a school, you're, you're not really staying consistent with what you're trying to accomplish. And so if you're, if you're working with groups of 10 or 20 students, you need to really look at those outcomes for 10 or those 10 or 20 students at that individual level and not at the group level. Um, and so oftentimes, it may sound very common sense, but oftentimes you see programs that are uh, intended to work with subgroups within a school, but they're looking at school-wide outcomes. And that is usually a function of what kind of data are available. Um, but it's important to know because that, that has implications for what you're likely to see and, and certainly what you're able to learn from your own experiences. If you want to look at those, the outcomes and the extent to which your work is, is producing the outcomes that you hope. Um, so as I said, that is 
that that is a very quick overview of, of some ideas around evaluation. I think what I want you to, to take from this is that while I ended with these this idea of formal evaluation, I, I still think, and I would encourage you to think about the continuous improvement idea and approach to evaluation and how we can build this kind of work into our regular routines in our schools and in our organizations so that we always see evaluation as a process of improvement and getting better incrementally rather than a sort of one big splash kind of, of event, right? Evaluation shouldn't be an event. It should be a process that we use to help all of this work get better over time and as we continue in, and continually need to improve. I mean, we know that nothing is perfect. We know there's always room for improvement and we need to build in these processes to help us understand how to, how to get better, how to do, make that improvement actualized. So there it is. The, the key is staying on target. Thank you, Dr. Sheldon. And we don't have any questions at the moment, but I did just wanted to ask you um, quickly, as I was thinking, you provided certainly a great so, you know, starting point to really reflect and think about the practices and um, strategies that might be, you know, school might be already doing or a program, right, um, centered around families and student learning. But do you have any other resources that, um, you know, are our participants who, you know, work at the complex level, who work in the schools, um, maybe principals that they could, you know, take a look at to maybe even help support them in, you know, evaluating or just reflecting on the way that they engage with their families. I'm, so, so that's it's that's a bit of a tricky question, only because um, people are doing so many different things, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the key here is that you need an evaluation that is true to the work that you're doing. And so, so I, I guess I would say, I, I would encourage people to, to, to look into the plan, plan, study, do, act, plan, do, study, act. I always get the, <laughs> the, the order, yes. I always get those, I always get, you, you think after all these years, I would have it down in my head. Um, and it just turns out I don't, but, um, there, you know, there are lots of templates that you can use to really understand how to take these procedures and these processes and, and tailor them to the work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I think, so for me, so I guess that's, that might be an unsatisfying answer. And I apologize for those of you who are, you know, really hungry for the, the resource. But I, I really believe that this work ultimately will serve you best if you take the time to um, develop it around the work that you're doing and understanding your, you know, the, the logic within your own work. And so oftentimes, you know, it is oftentimes most of the programmatic work, we know what we want to achieve down the road, right? If it's a school, we oftentimes are being held accountable to student outcomes. Um, mm -hmm. There might be some community groups that are working to um, support families and, and, and parenting skills or parenting knowledge of school systems. So, you know, we have to think about those kinds of outcomes. And so to that, I would say, I, I, you know, I, I think a good logic model goes a long way to helping us understand how our evaluation can work and, and how, and, and to help us do that. I know a lot of places have logic models or they've already done that. So I, I mean, so I, again, I know it's not, a, I know it's not a satisfying answer, Angela, and I, I, I apologize. To no, no, extent, I think it makes I, I a lot of sense. Um, it makes I, a lot I think of sense. It, yeah. And, and I think there is, I mean, you know, of course you can always email me and, and talk with me, but um you know, for people who are interested in doing this, there, there are, in fact, a lot of resources and templates that you can get through Google to help, to help you proceed through this work um, and, and that kind of modeling works. I think the hardest, the hardest part of this, I think, is, you know, what are the right indicators? Mm -hmm. And that's where you need a lot of people. And, and to me, that, that's the hardest part, but maybe the, the, 
it's it's not as important as getting all of the perspectives of the people that have a stake at this engaged and involved in this kind of work. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that our work with family and community engagement really will get better until we bring families and community partners to the table um, with, with an equal voice to the school. I think there's there are issues of power sharing that need to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and until we do that, I, I don't think we're ever going to really be satisfied with, with progress here, I think. Um, so, so there uh, what thank you, Dr. Shaw. There was one question or um, kind of one thought, and it go, uh, the question is, or statement is, we spend a lot of time collecting data, but less so explaining what it means to parents. Do you agree? Yeah. I agree, agree. I, so, you know, and I would add to that, <clears throat> that part of the problem is that I don't think we collect the data that most parents even want. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I, you know, what parents want, so this is, this is a slightly, this, right, this is a little off topic, but I'm going to stand on this soapbox, so indulge me a second. Uh, you know, parents want to know how their kid is doing. Mm -hmm. Right. How is, you know, how, is my child doing okay in school? Are they learning what they need to learn? And a grade or a test score number doesn't answer that problem, yeah. doesn't answer that question. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes we want to know as parents, you know, how is my child doing but I don't even know the answer to that if I don't know what my children are supposed to learn, mm -hmm. right? So, so what are we trying to accomplish here in this math class or in this reading class or American government class or, or you know, you, you, whatever we're learning? Um, is my child, you know, is my child on track to do okay? Uh, or, you know, I have these goals and these hopes and dreams and aspirations for my children is my daughter on track to, to meet those aspirations mm -hmm. or, or aspirations that I have, or, or maybe more importantly, as they get older, aspirations that she has? Mm -hmm. um, and so those are the kinds of things, that's the kind of information they want, not a, not a, a snapshot at one point of time of, a, of an arbitrary number. Mm -hmm. um, and I know, you know, we have benchmarks of like, you know, basic, you know, below basic, basic, proficient, but but families want to know, you know, is proficient good enough? We assume mm -hmm. proficient is good enough because we think we understand what proficient means. Mm -hmm. um, and and if if we're proficient, if a you know child is doing well, families want to know um, what what can they do to really strengthen or improve on other skills. So that right. you're right that that number definitely doesn't reflect that. So that relationship piece, the conversations that are had are the most meaningful. Um, I think that that's I think. I think those numbers can be used to help facilitate a discussion mm -hmm. with families and the data can be used to facilitate discussion. But oftentimes I see that the numbers are used to shut down conversations. Mm -hmm. And that's a real problem in my opinion, mm -hmm. because it's not, it's not what I, that, that's not how I think those numbers should be used. Mm -hmm. My point there. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sheldon. This has been um, such a great kind of uh, uh, information and starting point for, for our participants who are joining us today. Um, so we are um, going to move on. And, and if you do have any questions, I do encourage you folks to reach out to Dr. Sheldon. Um, like I said, he's working with us and we're very excited to have him part of our team. Um, but we will be moving- stop sharing, by the way. So oh, thanks. Thank you, Steve. So we are going to move on to um, just a quick break, um, just for the sake of time. We we wanted to give uh, 10 minutes, but what we'll do is do a, a short five minute break here. All right, welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. I'm excited for our next presenters. Um, they are um, here, um, one of our very own um, local, locally 
um, in the wonderful um, Big Island. And um, it was just a pleasure working with these um, two wonderful ladies last year when we did our training with the Big Island cohort schools um, around family engagement. Um, so I would like to introduce Blake Ann and Tita Sato. Um, she works with the Ka'u Complex Area, the Title I linker. And then Robin Miriam Walker. She's an English language resource teacher. Thank you and welcome. Hello, let me share my screen. Yes, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. There we go. Okay. Hey, so good morning. I'm Blake Ann and Tita Sato, like Angie mentioned, and I have my colleague Robin with us here today, too. Um, we're from the Ka'ukeo um, Pohoa Complex area on the east side of the Big Island, and we were part of the family engagement cohort last year with three out of our nine schools. So we're just going to share a little bit of our experience with all of you today. So prior to being a part of the cohort, our schools based their parent and family engagement events and activities um, on historical practices that were kind of might have been outdated or not necessarily aligned to a learning goal. So a single school would have multiple events like trunk or treat, literacy nights, family nights, um, and the list goes on. We believe that any type of event would check the box for having parent and family engagement. And we would always think like, we're bringing all these families in, um, why aren't our um, achievement scores increasing or why isn't our attendance increasing? So it was a mind shift, um, mindset shift for us to move from just having these events, but now to using data, uh, using a strategy of working with families in partnership to, um, a, focus on a specific learning goal to, to address academic success. So as our three schools went through the training, we first had to do some self-reflection. We had to look at our core beliefs about parent and family engagement and learn where we were as a school in implementing high impact strategies and where we wanted to go or needed to go. We're assuming like many of you, um, like our teachers and school staff, they never received any formal teacher training on how to work with families. So we knew that what we knew what the research said about family engagement and how it supports academic achievement, but we didn't know how to go about it and or how to engage families. So as our three schools received training through the cohort, we use our programs, um, myself through Title I and Robin with Title Three, to provide many PDs to our coordinators from our six schools emphasizing that families should leave the event knowing more about what their child should know and be able to do and leave knowing um, how to use a skill to support the learning goal. So with that, we saw um, other schools who weren't necessarily part of our cohort implement virtual family engagement initiatives. So for example, this school did um, a postcard writing event focusing on the writing standard where they modeled how to write with families and another school um, did a reading activity with families during the school day. So um, the COVID pandemic, it allowed our families to look into the child's classroom and they were online learning with their, with their children, right? Communicating with their child's teacher and school um, through emails, through texts, through Google Classroom or other apps. So more so than ever before. And although the events, for these particular schools might not have um, included all of the six process conditions that Dr. Mapp mentioned earlier in the dual capacity framework. It was obvious that the schools are more intentional about um, planning the event, making it linked to learning and more intentional about communicating with families. One of our schools, well, one of our schools used their Title I parent and family engagement money to create an online channel to engage all stakeholders and allow families to share their culture and knowledge with the rest of the school and community. So building on the relationship piece of working with families. Other schools purchase programs such as Ready Rosie um, to provide video models and activities to inspire rich conversations and interactions between adults and children, or they hire um, family engagers to connect parents and teachers and provide PD for parents with strategies um, used in school so they could better help um, their child academically at home. Thanks, Blake Ann. Um, 
uh, one of the activities uh, schools participated in were something called um, virtual walkthroughs and those were kind of done really early and after participating in the virtual walkthroughs um, one of the recommendations was to add signage in other languages spoken by families uh, several administrators that we worked with um, expressed interest in having a welcome banner fronting the school that included all the language spoken by their student population so um, over the summer and after our experience with the cohort, um, our resource team designed um, using sort of our, um, our complex area logo, which you can barely see in the background, um, but we designed a welcome banner and we had it printed for all of our nine schools. So kind of, you know, binding us together across the very um, geographic diverse area that we represent and included all the languages of our complex area that are frequently used by our families across the complex area. You can see it there. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk a little bit Title III. Blake Ann was very generous in saying that we did a lot of PD. I think she did a lot more than I did, but this has always, you know, been a nagging, you know, parent family engagement has been really a nag component of um, comprehensive EL program for me in, in my time in this position. So under Title III, as you can see there, we have um, a comprehensive English learner plan, which um, schools are asked to, uh, where, where schools are asked to promote parent involvement in students' learning by having at minimum two events or activities annually. And what we've done historically is kind of tag on to other types of events like open house or um, parent teacher conference. So really wanting to develop some sort of parent family engagement that really focuses on English language development and, and include our families in those discussions. So something that we've really been starting to think about is implementing um, um, a, the Title III family engagement opportunity is to utilize um, components from our new, we have these new e ELD standards or a standards framework from WIDA, that's our con consortium partners, um, that is going to help us address what we're seeing across our complex area in terms of our students um, performance in language specifically speaking and writing as well as things that we observe in our, our classroom um, visits so what you see there is really cute it's from the WIDA website it's an image of a meeting room with a cross section of educators and one of those is, is a parent and family in engagement um, liaison and we, we think of ourselves in EL program as, as, as taking on that role as well. So from that perspective, we see the importance of students and families understanding one of the components of the framework called the key language uses. And you can kind of see them there. <laughs> Blake Ann's got them flashing um, in, the, in the colored circles. There's four of them, which are very central to the framework. Um, as well as to our students' academic success and um, ability to communicate effectively in many contexts. So we see this as a starting point to connect the, the ways families already use language at home and in their communities to these key language uses and their narrate, inform, explain, and argue. So we, we, we we're going to really capitalize on that. Um, eventually, you know, after building these relationships, we want to see co-creating resources with families that highlight the ways of using language for these um, these four um, uses or purposes um, at home, in the community, as well as in in the school setting. Um, Something we did see as an outcome of our participation is when we worked with the schools this year on their academic plans, um, or actually it was at the end of last school year, what we started to notice is that they were adding parent and family, specifically parent and family engagement enabling activities in their plans to address school-wide goals. So you see verbiage like build relationships with families by establishing clear communication between school and home. 
In order to build the capacity of all our schools, um, the three pilot schools that Lake Ann and I worked with uh, will participate again this year in their second, uh, their second year of the cohort, while our other six schools receive training from the Hawaii Statewide Family Engagement Center through our CLSD grant. Um, we still have work to do, but now that, you know, once our entire complex area has the same foundation and understanding, we can, we can build from there. Well, the three things we want um, to leave you with today, if anything, is the importance of using data to determine a learning goal that's addressed throughout the year um, with each interaction with families. Um, and like I said, you know, our goal is really to, to move to the point where families are co-creators and co-producers of family engagement events and activities. And this last one, this third one, really important that administrator involvement in the trainings is really key in order to ensure success and sustainability in the future. Um, we want to just leave you with this um, kind of a quote from uh, a gentleman named Principal Brooks Prin. He is a heavy family engagement um, advocate. And if you can see on his t-shirt, he says, parent is a verb. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it just takes me back to the experience of itself. And it was just amazing, even though we couldn't do the physical walkthrough, right? It was just really nice to be able to do it virtually. So it still, it still worked out and all the amazing reflection and discussions that we had. And it's just so, it's so great that we're gonna be continuing the work with you and the rest of the schools in that complex area. I, I do have a question, um, not my own personal question, but a question that someone um, had posed. Um, it is in the chat box. What about interaction through the arts and resources? Um, we had an art family online engagement, which is fantastic. Uh, we had a virtual sing along around the world, world using um, these different subjects, as you can see, Hawaiian music, literacy, art, cultures, languages. Do those kind of engagements still count if we're including a link to core subject areas? For example, winter concert that is cross-curricular in-person version would be post-COVID, of course. What are your thoughts on that? So, Rob, so one of the things we were, um, we were emphasizing with our schools is that although those things are great, we could still continue to do that. But once you identify your school's learning goal, everything you guys do should integrate that kind of learning into the event. For example, if the school identifies using data that the learning goal is focusing on reading comprehension, every event you guys have, trunk or treat, um, music night or whatever it is, how can you incorporate reading comprehension into that event so that the families are overwhelmed at reading comprehension strategies and all that they um, um, do and interact with you guys that they can use those strategies at home with their children as well. Robin, did you want to add to any? No. Yes. And, and um, I think it's, you know, what we talked about when we were meeting with individual school teams and with you folks is just keeping it simple, you know, really mm -hmm. keeping it simple and identifying one thing that families can really help and support learning, right? And there could be room to really, um, you know, um, grow upon that, but keeping it simple, right? Establishing the relationship centered on student learning. Um, I, I don't have any questions. I don't see any other questions. So I just wanted to say thank you both for all the work that you're doing. Um, it's, it's just quite amazing. And we're just so grateful to be continuing that partnership with you folks. Thank you, mahalo. So now we're gonna go ahead and, and move forward, folks. Um, we have 15 more minutes with you lovely and beautiful people. So let me go ahead and just share my screen. And then what I'll do is I will turn it over to um, our program manager, Lisa, Lisa Ng, to share a little bit more about the resources that we have available. Mahalo, Angela. Um, aloha, everyone. So main thing we wanna get out there is our website. It's https slash slash cds coe.hawaii.edu slash HVAC. As a reminder, you're going to get a copy of all of our slides with all these things linked in it. And my lovely assistant Maggie is going to be <clears throat> chatting um, the links to all these resources that we'll be sharing. So um, 
Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Carol Hitchcock to explain one of our great resources that you should keep an eye out for in the future. Carol? Great, thank you, Lisa, and welcome everyone. When we identified that uh, many classroom teachers had not had the opportunity to have professional development for family engagement, we created a 15 week long PDE3 semester course. Now this first one is gonna focus on teachers supporting families and students in grades K3. Um, so we're really excited to offer that to you. It's, it's rigorous, it's a, it's a graduate level course. Um, and we've tried to design it so it's very interactive with engaging and it is of course based on Dr. Mapp's model and all her work. So we will be you know, refreshing um, the mindset, the importance of the mindset, um, the, the research impacts, um, all of the things that the dual capacity building framework um, and high impact activities and things that teachers can implement. But the real secret sauce, and this is the part I'm so excited about, is a case study that the teachers will actually implement with students and families from their classroom. So they will actually, we encourage them to go through these various stages of establishing relationships of trust and, and building that early on in the semester. And then going through the lesson plans and adding evidence-based family engagement strategies that families can practice at home. I loved the way you mentioned Class Dojo, uh, Blake Ann and, and Robin, because we're going to have a class on technology and how to use Class Dojo to create little snippets of videos of uh, reading or math skills that, that families can implement at home, give them a chance to practice. Um, so, and also the parents can then choose to see which language do they want communication um, to themselves. So I, I love that app. Um, we're always looking for new ideas. Um, and of course, then finally, we want to have a section on data because we really think that um, our instruction should be data informed, data driven, and that teachers can use data to provide positive growth information to their families to show the improvement that their students are making. So providing a platform for that to happen and those conversations to take place um, will be part. And then at the end, the teachers will put all of their work together in a portfolio as the PDE3 courses require with a lot of reflections and interactive discussions with their colleagues. So we're really excited. It's gonna be offered for the first time in spring 2022. Um, so unfortunately it's full already, but we, will, we do hope that we will be able to offer it again in the future. Thank you. So Ange, next slide, please. All right, so on our website, we have this wonderful thing under downloadables. You can find downloadables on the top right of your screen. Mahalo for the, uh, for the link. And it's a really great resource that you can use. Like it's not just at the very beginning of the school year, but can, you can implement any of these activities at any time during the school year with your families and the parents and students. Um, it's, these are clear examples, some of them with instructional videos or example videos on how like Dr. Mapp said to build that partnership with the families. So check it out. We've got high impact core practices for you, videos, tips, tools, we've got templates. One of my favorites is uh, just this parent profile for your student where you fill out information about your student and send it to your teacher so they have an idea of who your child is before the school year starts or at any point in time if you need to build that with, um, that relationship with uh, the teacher. And as teachers, share this tool with your parents. Uh, my son's teacher sends their own version home with us um, that we have to fill out information about our child, return it to the teacher, and then as a reciprocal feedback, they schedule a virtual home visit with us to talk stories about what we put on there, what our wishes, hopes, dreams, concerns are. Next slide, please. This is a wonderful thing. We, we came out with these earlier um, this fall. These are family guides that you as teachers can share with your families to help them understand how they can support their child. It, has, it includes what students are learning by grade level in general. It talks about um, how to talk about literacy with your keiki or their keiki. It includes education words because sometimes educators and students use words that have specific meanings in school and understanding the words that are bolded in the guide will help you speak the same language. It also has tips for parents on how to talk with teachers. Uh, it, 
I think each section includes ways to connect classrooms to careers, as well as other like online tools and resources that families can look to for help. So check it out, grades K through five, six through eight, high school literacy and math. Alrighty, so this is our YouTube channel. I'm gonna, I'm gonna override and I'm gonna start sharing my screen really quick to give you an idea of um, where you can find this. So here's our webpage. And you just click on this little icon here on YouTube or when you receive the slide, just click on the slides. I've hyperlinked everything ready for you there. And we've got really great videos that you can use as teachers or even you know at home or share with your families about how to support children with literacy. So we have some information for grades one through three, just really setting that foundation. And what's really cool, I think one of our favorite videos here is um, video 2.1, I think here, add a sound to make a new word. I use this at home with my Kiki, um, but these are just examples of resources that you can share out with families in like quick emails or e-blasts, um, whatever, like school messenger, whatever that you use with families. Um, just little tidbits like this can really help build that supporting um, and trusting relationship between parent, educator, and even community members um, that you bring into your school. Maybe they can demonstrate something like this for your Kiki and the parents. Alrighty, um, and I'll stop sharing and I'll turn it back to you. Well, hello everyone. All right, folks, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen one more time. Um, I I want to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Chuan Chen for some closing remarks. Um, I did put the, the survey um, for you to, for your feedback into the chat box. Thank you. I just wanted to say mahalo everyone for attending our symposium. You know, I, I'd also like to uh, thank Dr. Mapp, Dr. Sheldon, Blake Ann, and Robin for sharing their Iki or knowledge and Manao ideas and thoughts with us today and for being our partners in education. Um, our center is looking forward to collaborating with the schools in KKP complex area um, in the fall, um, and then also the schools in Maui district. And um, also just that as a reminder, your feedback is very important to us. So please help us fill out the brief survey as your feedback um, helps uh, inform our work. So, um, if you uh, don't have time to do it now, don't worry. Uh, you will receive a post event email next Tuesday with the link, slides and video recording. Um, if you have any questions, you can still um, send it to us because any unanswered questions will be sent to our presenters and their response will be shared with you as soon as they are available. So thank you again. We look forward to collaborating with you for Hawaii's Keiki. Aloha. Thank you. Mahalo. Have a good, good day. Good weekend. We appreciate all the work that you do, folks.